By the end of today, you will have thrown away seven pounds of trash. By the end of this year, every individual in your household will have thrown away 1.3 tons of trash. Today, on a special episode of The Roundtable Perspective, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Edward Humes joins me in the studio, Karen Bishop Morris, and Ralph Mueller, Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs and Provost at Purdue University Northwest, to talk about garbology, our dirty love affair with trash, and the impact it has on the U.S. economy and environmental systems. Welcome to a special edition of the Roundtable Perspective. I'm your host, Karen Bishop Morris, Chair of the Department of English at Purdue University Northwest. I am joined by a very special guest today, Edward Humes, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. He's authored 14 books, including the one we'll be talking about today, Garbology, Our Dirty Love Affair with Trash. Garbology takes a comprehensive look at American trash habits, which affect our economy and the U.S. environmental system. Humes's other critically acclaimed nonfiction books include Force of Nature, Monkey Girl, Over Here, School of Dreams, No Matter How Loud I Shout, and the bestseller Mississippi Mud. In addition to the Pulitzer, he is the recipient of a Penn Center USA Award and numerous other honors for his journalism and books. Also in the studio today is my co-host, Ralph Mueller, Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs and Provost at Purdue University Northwest. So let's get right into it, Dallin. Um, I am very curious, Ed, about sort of your style of writing and how would you characterize the genre? It's sort of part storyteller, part something else? Well, it's nonfiction. It's, it's, it's journalism, but yeah, it's, it's not an issue book as much as it's, it's a people book. It's about communities and families and individuals who are uh, interested in being less addicted to trash and waste. So what was your overall goal? Is it for people to live waste-free? Is this even possible? I mean, what are you trying to accomplish in the book? Uh, I w I'm not suggesting anybody do anything other than be aware of the consequences of the choices that we make as consumers or as, as manufacturers or as, as communities. Um, because I really think there's a complete lack of awareness that you know, Americans are the world champions of waste, that the amount of things that we throw away, the materials that they're made of, uh, imposes a terrible cost on our, on our planet, uh, on our wallets, uh, uh, and is really at the root of most of our big problems. If you dig down into environmental problems, pollution, energy costs, uh, all sorts of social issues, um, pollution, food chain problems, all of it traces back to waste in some form or another. I mean, a great example is all the energy we produce in this country and use, whether it's to drive our cars or whether it's to light our houses or whatever, we waste more than we actually use out of what we generate. We literally are just throwing away trillions of dollars every year just through our normal activity and unaware of it. I'm certainly much more aware of what I'm throwing away these days than after reading the book, so it's, it's interesting. Absolutely. I want to piggyback on something you said, Ed, just about Americans and how we compare to sort of other cultures in terms of the amount that we waste. And one of the really compelling things about the book is all of these really interesting sort of facts. They're really startling statistics. I mean, there's one, for instance, where you say if Americans were to, you know, amass all of the trash on their front lawn in a year, it would be about 1.3 tons. Per person in the per house. Per person yeah. in the house, which is... 50% more than our Danish counterparts and roughly double what the average uh, Japanese citizen uses. So I'm just wondering, can you react a little bit? What do you think those numbers reflect about our attitudes toward consumerism? I, I, well, there's a lot of perverse incentives up and down our, our um, I call it the disposable economy. You know, the single largest um, type of trash we generate now is now packaging in containers. Oh. Right? It's not the products themselves, it's the things that they come to. And so it's instant trash, right? As soon as you get that material, and it's a cost, it's built into the cost of what you're making, it gets thrown away. And that would be okay if it could be repurposed or remanufactured or recycled efficiently, but most of it can't be. And so it ends up in landfills. Um, you could theoretically recycle a lot of that stuff, but nobody wants the end product of that. It's not, it's, a, it's value is far less than what it costs to create. So we've instead of trying to be more intelligent about how we package things or how we 
consume things, we just sort of externalize those costs. I think a lot of people have heard about the ocean plastic pollution yes. issue. So yes. it's a great example. This plastic, like a plastic grocery bag, it has a, a useful life you measure in minutes, but physically it will endure in the environment for 500 years or more. So we're making disposable things out of eternal materials and then just letting them loose and it's wreaking havoc on our, uh, not only the oceans themselves, but on our food chain. And it's injecting toxins into it, the fish that we buy at the market and eat. And, it, and nobody is paying for that. It's the cost of that, and it's an immense cost, isn't built into the price of the goods. So it's like we're subsidizing waste. And there's this crazy idea that that is a free market principle, but actually, if you think about it, people should pay their own way. And, and whether for the good or the bad, if they're creating harm, that's a cost that should be on them, but that's not how we've set it up. And if you even bring up the subject of, well, the manufacturers of, of disposable plastic bottles, like you know, a soda company, should be responsible for the fate of what they're putting out in the world. That would be free, a free market principle, but we're not doing that. We're subsidizing it by letting them kill our oceans, <laughs> which is literally what's happening. So, so this is part of what's so remarkable about the book, and, and that is that you, you really are. I, I, I mean, when I was reading, I, I kind of had this um, vision of you sort of like, you know, you know, tra tra following oceanographers and, you know, going to college campuses and, you know, polling their um, recycling processes. And so how does a project like this unfold? There are a lot of intellectuals in our, in our audience, and I think that it would be interesting for them to understand how you collect and sort of organize so much disparate kinds of data into a coherent. Well, for me, it's always that you have to find the story. Nobody's going to pick up a a book that's just filled with trash data and read it for you know, enjoyment because it won't be enjoyable, right? But there was the data collection part. I mean, there's, there's a lot of numbers out about how much trash we make, and most of them are wrong. Uh -huh. And for decades, we've underestimated our trashiness, frankly. I mean, uh, so correcting that was part of, the, part of the mission. But really finding, you mentioned the oceanography, finding the story of plastic pollution for me was <clears throat> uh, meeting and, and, and learning about uh, a woman named Miriam Goldstein at uh, Scripps uh -huh. Institute in California. She's the seasick marine biologist. That's how I always think of it. She <laughs> hates to be on the water, but she's, she's passionate about finding out about plastic pollution and what it's doing to, to the oceans, to the wildlife, and to us, because that's where a principal food supply for, for the world exists. Um, so it's really important work. Others are doing it too, but it's, it was, her story is a way of explaining to people the story of plastic pollution in a way that's that, that's enjoyable to read about because she's an incredible person and you know I, I spent a lot of time quality time at landfills where, where <laughs> uh, and so I met this guy Big Mike who drives this giant German made earth mover called the Bomag yes and Big Mike has a, Big Mike has a lot of insight into what we throw away he says you don't you will never believe what gets thrown away in a landfill I mean it's, hot tubs, furniture, tractor trailer loads of edible food, all hold there and, and he, was, he just hang with me for a while. And I did, and it was amazing. And you think, oh, a guy who's working on top of a landfill every day must be um, sort of uh, jaded about it, but he's not. He really cares about what he's doing and, and feels like he's, he's doing his bit to, to at least safely corral this material from, you know, and not getting out into the environment and causing more harm. So it was, I had a blast doing the research on this. It, it, it comes through. That comes through in the book. So, so who's to blame for all this trash? Uh, is it is it industry? Is it government? Is it businesses? Or is it individual Americans? Uh, all of the above, really. I mean, we've it, literally it's a systemic problem, and it's um, there's a great book. I'm sure you've heard of the Fast Food Nation. Yes. So I really admire that book because uh, what the author did was take something that's just staring us in the face mm -hmm. and looking at what it has done to our diets, what it's done to our agricultural systems, the, the massive chain, change uh, that occurred because of the rise of, of fast food that nobody really thinks about when they go through the drive through and get their french fries. Right? Right, right. And that's kind of inspired my approach for, for garbology because it's, it's really the same thing. We've, we've created this magical system called waste management. And think about, just think about that term. It's not waste reduction department or waste elimination, <laughs> it's managing. And managing, in this case, just means hiding it from us. Yes. And, uh, and, and you roll it to the curb and poof, it's gone. 
and you don't think about it. And because it's, you know, you're taking your trash out episodically, you don't really see that the average American is on, on the road to 1.3 tons uh, a year and figure out your average lifespan and you'll realize it's so 102 we, like, tons of trash. So can we, can we blame one group more than the other, groups versus individuals? Or is it, is it, is it all confounded hmm. and we are all pointing the finger at each other in a rightful way? I, I, oh, I, I think we see uh, nowhere to point the finger in our, in our general approach to life because when we buy a, a plastic water bottle, we're not really thinking about what's the fate of that plastic. We're just thinking, oh, we need the water, it's on sale at the supermarket. We, uh, we've evolved from a, a much more thrifty kind of economy where people uh, buy things to last that are durable. I mean, the, the things that were thrown away 100 years ago, there was no plastic in it. Um, there was some paper, but mostly it was things that had worn out as opposed to things that were designed to be disposable. And the fact that we think what we're doing now is normal is, uh, is a barrier to doing, doing anything about it. It's like, why should we care? Why should we recycle? Why, why shouldn't we buy these convenience products? And, and uh, it's easy to do because the costs are hidden from us and, or passed on to, to others. I, my favorite example is junk mail. Mm. You know, one out of every hundred pounds that goes to the landfills is junk mail. Mm -hmm. And it's this massively subsidized product. Nobody pays less to mail something than a junk mailer. So, uh, you know, the rest of us who have to buy regular postage uh, are paying for that. And then the junk mailer doesn't have to clean up his mess, right? Somebody else has to haul it away and dispose of it and deal with it. Um, so it's a very perverse incentive supporting a, a business model that couldn't exist if they actually had to bear their own costs. There would be no junk mail. So it's pernicious and it's, it's you know, it's a subsidized form of waste. And you see those kinds of incentives against being less wasteful and in favor of being more wasteful all throughout our consumer practices or products. And, it's very difficult to say who's at fault for that. Is it the junk mailer? Is it the policy makers who make it easy on the junk mailers? Is it the citizens who put up with it? You know, I don't, all of the above, I guess. I think you, know, you said something really profound when you said you know, we sort of roll it to the curb and it's out of sight, out of mind. And it, and it really raises a question for me about you know, where is this all going in the current economic and political climate? Like where, where, how are we doing? I mean, where will we be? Where should we be 50 years from now in terms of thinking about landfills and the way we transform our trash? Well, I think we can look to what other, other countries are, you know, we, we landfill 69% of our waste right mm -hmm, now mm -hmm. and uh, something on that order. Uh, we're relatively bad at recycling, but if you look at sort of our peer nations, um, you know, advanced economies uh, like Germany or Austria, other European nations, um, they are landfilling, you know, one or two percent of their waste. They are literally disappearing landfills. And it's not because they're exporting their trash like we do to other countries. Right. Uh, it's because they are reducing the waste stream itself. And some countries are looking at clean uh, burning of trash to produce energy. Mm -hmm. Denmark has become energy independent by doing that in part. Um, there's also mandates to use materials that are um, less wasteful and more recyclable and more uh, usable. And that's having a trickle down effect on the US because everything's a global market now. Yes. So often the improvements in, in products and packaging that are made because of other countries' mandates are, are but we benefit from to some extent. Um, so that's good. So 50 years from now, I, I don't think landfills as we know them need to exist. Mm -hmm. uh, if, there's, uh, if there's an outcry uh, or, or a, uh, a na national will to make them go away, we could. Mm -hmm. It's right. great technology, 3D printing, and that uh, has the promise in 50 years to basically ship virtually products. Mm -hmm. No packaging, no, no, you just 
whatever product you want to purchase will <laughs> essentially materialize near you somewhere and uh, eliminate a lot of the waste and, and transport and energy use now built into our consumer So ha have you seen communities, for example, that work close together or how should communities huh? work closer together to, to address some of the issues? That communities are the key and whether that's a, a town or a, a neighborhood or a campus, um, that's where the action is going to be. We're not going to get national mandates. Uh, you know, the era of you know, something like the Endangered Species Act, which was passed in the 1970s, or the Clean Water Act, um, where the U.S. Senate votes unanimously for, <laughs> for these incredibly forward-thinking environmental um, programs. Uh, I don't foresee that kind of um, unanimity anywhere uh, in the near future at the national level, but at communities. Trash is a local thing. It's the ultimate mm -hmm. local product. It's our biggest local product, right? That's it's right. the biggest thing we make. Uh, and um, that's where people can come together and say, you know, waste is just, it doesn't matter. It's not a political issue. It's a cost. Mm -hmm. And it's a harmful cost. And, and what can we do about it? So some communities say, well, we don't want plastic grocery bags anymore. I mean, just, cities all over the place have done that. I've been to campuses where, as you have, have here have um, these water stations and refillable water bottles and, yes. and some places are saying well we don't want and we're not going to have the plastic water bottles anymore mm -hmm. and you think oh big deal it's this product but really at the community level when you start making those small choices to be less wasteful it, it has an impact and also it influences uh, other places to say well if they can do it why, why you know why can't, why can't we the key to all of this are the communities and there's not much that we can do uh, at the federal level uh, what about in between? So how do the regulatory agencies across state lines, how should they work together? Well, there's, uh, uh, we could look at recycling. You look at the eight states that have um, container deposit laws and they, they are running circles around the rest of the states in terms of the amount of material that gets recycled because they give a simple and clear incentive to, for people to recycle. You get your nickel back, right? <laughs> and it, it doesn't, I, and, and there's actually an entire industry around uh, people making money off of that, uh, saving uh, the, uh, uh, con the consumer from having to bother with, <laughs> with going to the recycling <clears throat> station as people will do it for you, or you could do it yourself and you know, make, get your money back. But it's, it's a simple uh, incentive for people to do the right thing, and, uh, and it works. It's, it's wildly successful. And those kinds of ideas, uh, city of Los Angeles, imposed a grocery, or county of Los Angeles, imposed a grocery bag ban. You could buy a paper bag for 10 cents. You couldn't get a plastic bag or you could bring your own bag. And it was an uproar over this, right? I'm People sure. were so ticked off about this and they'd forget to bring their bags. They didn't want to pay the dime. They'd just carry stuff out in their arms and cans would be dropping. Uh, but you know, people are creatures of habit. So you get sick of doing that, and the first two times you forget your bag, but after you do it for 10 times, it's a habit, and it's a new habit. So you, you look at, in one year, the county of Los Angeles, nine million people reduced their uh, consumption of disposable grocery bags by 70% in mm -hmm. one year. And that's, I mean, that's huge across nine million people, and it only took a dime, <laughs> a dime to get that's people monumental. to make that change. Yep. So communities, states, national policies, um, uh, international quickly. Um, as of January 1, um, China made a statement of not accepting certain uh, types of uh, waste from, uh, from across their borders. So what interplay, what partnerships should there be uh, across national borders and uh, globally? Well, that was never really a partnership that China was accepting the the, our waste, as you know, they were our trash compactor. That was our biggest export, <laughs> trash to uh, to China, and and so that can go two ways. Are we going to search for some other uh, market to dump our waste on? Are we going to use this as a moment to say, well, you know, maybe we need a different strategy. Maybe we shouldn't be producing so much material that nobody wants. Uh, this is this is the time when we can really rethink that because there are better materials than the ones we use mm -hmm. right now that. Uh, retain value and can be uh, remanufactured or recycled efficiently. Um, now, now is it the best time? I mean, this is the opportunity, really. And people are looking at it as a problem. It's it's a massive opportunity to to have some significant change in the kinds of of stuff we're sending out in the world. Um, 
you know, every material that we have for single use should be sort of on the, like aluminum. It's one of the few disposable products we have that is efficient. It's infinitely recyclable. Mm -hmm. uh, it, if you take recycled aluminum, it costs less than 95, it's 95 percent less cost than virgin aluminum. So it's the ultimately reusable product and there's a lot of it out in the world and it's relatively benign once the initial manufacturing process is over. So if all our disposable materials were like that, we'd be in great shape and we wouldn't need China. So, Ed, I want to go back to something you talked about packaging a little while ago, and I think it's really, there have been some headlines recently, like McDonald's by 2025, they're going to 100% recyclable materials in their packaging, and I think currently they're at about 10%, which is, is a little, you know, hard to believe, really, when you think about, you know, the straws and the Big Mac container and the bags and all this stuff, and in seven years, they'll be at 100%. Um, I'm wondering if you are aware of any um, innovations in packaging, like how is this emphasis on recycling? Recycling and reusing going to change the packaging industry. Is there anybody doing cool stuff that you're aware of? Well, I, there's been a trend towards trying to reduce packaging. Um, uh, Walmart, uh, not everybody's favorite uh, corporate citizen, has really been committed to to reducing waste as a as a economic mm -hmm. engine, and so they calculate for every five percent they reduce packaging across their product line, they save $4 billion. Wow. <laughs> so they have a huge incentive to, to reform the way we package things. Now against that is sort of the rise of, of um, online purchasing, you know, and the elephant in the room is Amazon, and everybody who shops on Amazon yes. knows when <laughs> it's confounding, you'll order something and you get this free shipping, so there's no incentive to kind of wait and order everything at once. You just, oh, I want this, I want that. It's amazing. And then, Prime is amazing. And then each little thing, yeah, it's amazing, but each but. little thing will come in a big box that's yes. filled with nothing. And instead of the old model, you know, UPS, which does a lot of their delivery, used to be a company that um, took things business to business. That was their main source of income. Mm -hmm. And so you'd have a truckload of stuff that would go to a store and people would shop for it. Right. Now you have that same UPS truck going 100 different places, making 100 different deliveries in a day, and adding all that transportation and traffic and these giant boxes full of little things. And we haven't really reckoned with what that's doing to us and to our economy. We're just so infatuated with it that uh, 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 there, but there will be a, a cost associated to that that we're going to see down the line. And sure. I don't know what that is, but it's uh, something we will have to cope with. Sure, sure. So, you know, it seems to me that the book, at least in part, wants to um, bring about social change. Uh, what advice do you have to other writers that uh, are going toward that same goal in other areas? Uh, but what, what are the lessons that you have learned out of this project that sort of might help others? I, I think uh, on any subject, the, I, I'll take slight issue with the way you framed that question because I don't want to say I'm promoting a social cause. I'm promoting that people be aware of, of the consequences of their choices and then go forward. I mean, we should know what our consequences are, whether intended or unintended. And awareness is, is my, my goal. So that's what I advise to people who want to write about topics like this is uh, don't get up on the, uh, on the podium and shake your fist and say, you must do this. Just tell the story. We are the most wasteful people on the planet. That's not a cause. It's a fact. Hmm. What do we want to do with that? Is that how we want to be seen by the rest of the world? Is that what we want our legacy to be? Um, or do we want to um, try something else? Do we want to not leave 102 tons of waste behind us? You know, I, I calculated you, you get one grave for your body, but all the stuff you throw away, you need about 1,100 graves to accommodate the, the volume of our, our lifetime waste. And that's a terrible legacy. That's not what I want to have be the biggest thing I leave behind. And, and I think there's ways that can help, uh, choices we can make that would lead to a different outcome and would also make us more prosperous and healthy in the process. And, and actually, I call that a fact, not an opinion as well. I mean, the data is there. We could. We just aren't. So uh, I think a title that came out fairly recently called Door to Door, and it's kind of what we were just talking about a little while ago. It's what it takes to keep an average American family uh, mo <laughs> moving and also to move our stuff 
to mm. us and from us. So, so I kind of burrowed inside the transportation world the way I did with trash, and uh, and that was fun too. And uh, not un not coincidentally, the our, the single most wasteful activity we have in in our daily lives is our transportation. So. Well, you heard it here first. That's all the time we have on our program. I want to thank you uh, at Humes for joining me on the Roundtable Perspective. I'm Karen Bishop Morris. Thank you also, Ralph Mueller. See you next time.